Let's take a closer look at section 1.1 of the crash course, which consists of three main panels. The top panel is the program which you type and run. Then the bottom panel has the tasks for you to work through. And finally, the middle panel summarizes the key concepts which you have learned by doing the tasks. Let's take some time to go through these key concepts. First, there are commands. These are special words like print, input, for, and next, which YAR Basic recognizes as being instructions to do something. You cannot use these words as variable names. Then there are variable names. These are any other word or combination of symbols which is not a command. These can be very short like A, B or C or longer and more meaningful like limit, num1 or xval. For example, in this very simple program the variable names are number, answer, I and choice dollar. Each variable has its own location in memory, set initially to zero, except that string variables must end with a dollar sign and are initially set to the blank string. So in this very simple program, number has a memory location represented schematically by this box, which is initially set to zero. Similarly, answer is set to zero, and I is set to zero at the start of the program. Choice dollar, on the other hand, which is a string variable, is initially set to be just a blank. So do note that ordinary variables contain numbers, while string variables can also contain alphabetical symbols, which can be single letters, whole words, combinations of numbers and letters. And string variables need a dollar sign at the end of their name, where the dollar sign is really a capital S for string. Finally, do note that Variable names are case sensitive, that is capital A and lowercase a are different, which can be useful, but for beginners this can be a source of confusion. For example, number spelt capital N and number spelt lowercase n count as different variables in Yard Basic. Next there is the equal sign. This is an assignment operator, not an equation. This means that the expression on the right hand side is evaluated and this value is placed in the memory location of the variable on the left hand side. In particular, this means that there can only be one variable on the left hand side. For example, answer equals zero means take the value zero and place it in the memory location called answer. While answer equals answer plus i means add the contents of the memory locations answer and i, then place the resulting sum back in the memory location called answer. We shall see how these memory locations work in a bit more detail later. Then there are expressions. These are combinations of variables, arithmetic signs and strings, separated by commas. Note that spaces are ignored in expressions, so the judicious inclusion or exclusion of spaces can aid readability in your programs. For example, 
answer plus i is an expression. The arithmetic signs are just the usual plus or minus. Also, multiplication is represented by an asterisk, which is above the key for 8. Divide is represented by an oblique stroke, that is the one below the question mark, while exponent, which means to the power of, is represented by this wedge-shaped symbol, which is above the key for 6. Then there are line numbers. For example, 100 is a line number. Now these line numbers must all be different, but they can very usefully be placed on a blank line all by themselves. For example, we could place the line number 150 on this blank line, which is very useful because it means we can jump into the gaps between blocks of code. Now, older varieties of BASIC required line numbers on every line, which was quite tedious. But Yard Basic only needs line numbers when they serve some useful purpose. Finally, there is program flow. The computer executes each line in turn, one by one from top to bottom, unless a go-to or a next or some similar statement causes it to jump back to an earlier line. And this matches almost exactly how actual machine code executes inside the CPU. For example, this go to 100 causes the program to jump back to line 100, while this next i causes the program to jump back to this 4i line. But other than these jumps, the execution is in strict order from top to bottom, essentially like a shopping list. Do this, do this, do this, then end. Now, to understand what program flow really means, let's go through this very simple program line by line to see how it works. When we run the program, the first line which executes is this line right at the top. Print, enter a number. And on the black screen, we see the words, enter a number, appear. Then the next line which executes is input number, which prompts the user to enter a value for the variable number. And on the black screen, this prompt takes the form of a question mark. So suppose we type the number 5 and hit the enter button. Then the computer executes this whole block of code, which computes the answer. But since this block of code is a bit more complicated, we will skip over it for the moment and come back to it later instead. But because it does not contain any print statements, there will be nothing to see on the screen in any case. So the next thing we will see on the screen are the results. So the line print the sum from 1 to number gives on the black screen the sum from 1 to 5. Then the line print is answer on the black screen gives is 15. Then print want to start again yn yields this message on the black screen. Then input choice dollar results in this question mark, which again is prompting the user to enter something via the keyboard. So let's assume we enter Y for yes and press enter. Then the next line executes. If choice dollar equals Y, go to 100, which in this case is true. Choice dollar is equal to Y. So the program flow jumps back to line 100. And the whole sequence starts again from the top. Enter a number. Input number. Question mark. And so on. 
Now we have already learned something important, which is that all well-structured programs consist of three main parts. First, there is the user input. That is, where the human tells the computer what computation to do. Then there is the main routine, that is the middle part of the program, where the computer actually performs the requested computation. And finally, there is the computer output, where the computer tells the human what the answer to the computation is. Now, breaking up your program into blocks of code by inserting blank lines will help you see these parts more clearly. Always try to write your own programs using this same in, do, out, three-part structure. Here is an example showing how program flow means that the order of your lines of code is important. Suppose we take these two blocks of code and we reverse their order in the program to give something that looks like this. What goes wrong when we apply program flow from top to bottom? Hmm. Well here we need to know the value of number but we've not yet said what its value is, since this input line comes later. It may be zero by default, and then the program may do nothing at all, which is a very common problem for beginning programmers. So, if something needs to be done before something else, then it needs to appear earlier in your program. We have also learned something important about how your basic outputs to the black screen. Take this line for example. Print the sum from 1 to number, which on the black screen produced the sum from 1 to 5. So we see that text in quotations appears on the screen verbatim, while for variable names it's the value of the variable which appears on the black screen. Similarly, take this next line, print is answer, which on the black screen became is 15. So again we see that text in quotations appears on the screen verbatim, while for variable names it's the value of the variable which appears on the screen. So now, let's take a closer look at this middle block of code, where the computer actually performs the computation. Now, to make things easier for us humans to see what is going on, let's delete off this rem command. Now, rem is short for remark, and was originally meant for inserting human-readable comments, which the computer would ignore but it also turns out to be a super useful way of switching lines on or off without actually having to delete them. Now, deleting this rem activates the line print I answer, turning it into what is called a diagnostic line. A diagnostic line helps reveal the inner workings of your program. Use it temporarily to help you check that the numerical details are correct. Then rem it out again once you're sure everything is running properly. So let's try running this program again with the line unremmed. And this time we should try to keep track of the contents of the memory locations, which at the, st at the start are all set to zero except for choice dollar, which being a string variable is set to blank. So the black screen appears and the computer executes the first line, print enter a number, and we see the corresponding message on the black screen. 
Then the computer executes the second line, input number, and we see a question mark appear on the black screen. So let's assume we type the number 5 and press enter. Then the computer goes to the memory location allocated to the variable number and sets it to be 5. Then the computer executes the third line, answer equals 0. So it goes to the memory location allocated to the variable answer and sets it to 0. Hmm. Now, setting answer to be zero when it's already zero may seem unnecessary, but later we shall see how this is, in fact, very important. Then the computer executes the next line, for i equals one to number, which in this case means one to five, because number is five. So it goes to the memory location allocated to the variable i, and sets it to be the first of these values 1 to 5, which is 1. Then the computer executes the line answer equals answer plus i, which means it takes the values currently stored in answer and i and adds them together. 0 plus 1 equals 1 and places the result back in the memory location for answer. Then the computer executes our diagnostic line, print i answer. And on the black screen, we see the current contents of i and answer. Then the computer executes the line next i, which means it takes the current value of i and adds 1 to it. Then the computer checks to see if it needs to jump back to the 4i equals 1 to number line. That is, i should be 1 to 5, and since i equals 2 does not yet exceed number, which is 5, that is, the list of values 1 to 5 is not finished yet, the computer does jump back to the 4i line, and the program flow continues from there. So the computer executes the line answer equals answer plus i, which is 1 plus 2 equals 3, then that value of 3 is placed back in the memory location for answer. Then the computer executes the diagnostic line, print i, answer, and we see, appears on the black screen, the current contents of the memory locations i and answer. Then the computer executes the next i line, so the current value of i is increased by 1. Then the computer checks if it needs to jump back to the for i equals 1 to number line, that is, i is 1 to 5, and since i is 3, does not exceed number, which is 5, the computer does jump back to the for i line, and the program flow continues from there. So, answer equals answer plus i, 3 plus 3 is 6, and the memory location answer is updated to be 6. Then the diagnostic line prints to the black screen the current contents of the memory locations i and answer. Then next i, so the value of i increases by 1. Then to see if we need to jump back to the 4i line, i should be 1 to 5, and since 4 does not yet exceed 5, the computer does jump back, and on it goes. Answer equals answer plus i, 6 plus 4 is 10, so answer is updated to 10. Then print i answer displays on the black screen the current contents of the memory locations i and answer. Then next i, takes i and adds 1 to it to give 5. 
Then to see if we need to jump back, the computer checks the value of number. And since i equals 5 does not yet exceed number equals 5, the computer does jump back, and on it goes. Answer is answer plus i, 10 plus 5 is 15, and answer is updated to 15. Then print i answer displays on the black screen the current values of the memory locations i and answer. Then next i increases the value of i by 1 to 6. But now, when we check to see if we should jump back to the 4i equals 1 to number line, number is 5, then because i equals 6 now does exceed number equals 5, that means the list of values 1 to 5 is now finished. We've done them all. So the computer does not jump back this time. But instead, the program flow continues as normal to the next line in order, which is print the sum from 1 to number, which on the black screen appears as the sum from 1 to 5. Then print is answer on the black screen becomes is 15. Then print want to start again, yn places that message on the black screen, then input choice dollar results in a question mark on the black screen prompting us to enter something through the keyboard. So let's suppose we enter Y for yes. Then choice dollar equals Y will be true, so the computer jumps back. To line 100 at the start of the program. Now let's assume that we keep going and when the program prompts us to input number, let's assume this time we enter something different, like 3. This means that the memory location allocated to the variable number will be updated to 3. Then the computer executes the next line, answer equals 0. But now we see that unlike the first run through, when answer was initially set to 0, this time, answer still contains the results of the previous computation. So the computer deletes this and sets it back to zero. Now we can see why setting answer to be zero at the start of the computation is in fact very important. If we omit this step, then answer will still contain the results of the previous computation, which we don't want. So what are the two key takeaways from what we have just seen? First, there is the concept of program flow. Programs execute each line in turn from top to bottom, unless there is a go-to or a next which makes it jump backwards. Second, there is the concept of data permanence. Variables are set to zero by default at the start of the program and their values remain in place unless you specifically change them. These are the most important things for beginning programmers to keep in mind.